Hello, welcome back to our Bible study on Romans. And we left off a, last time in Romans 8.3 where it said, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So I want to pick it up tonight in verse 4 of Romans 8. And we'll continue our wonderful, wonderful journey through Romans so that we can have all that God has for us. And I want to uh, mention again, Brother Judd Smock, I'm going from his writings on Romans 8, uh, 6, 7, and 8. I think that he does a fantastic job uh, and has the truth for us. So uh, I want to give him the credit. And as I read along and and continue on in this Bible study so that we can be edified and we can learn the truth and we can be open to what the Holy Spirit has for us in this Christian walk and we can walk in truth and that's what ultimately uh, what we should endeavor for as Christians to be led of the Holy Spirit and he'll never lead us into error but he'll lead us into truth and and that is my prayer for this Bible study that Holy Spirit you would come and lead us into your truth that we might have victory in the name of Jesus. Uh, you know, and we need to be attuned to the, the scriptures. You can't just ignore scripture because scripture will lead us to the true Jesus. And it's there for our, uh, for our knowledge, our understanding, our mind, that we might know the true words of God, which the Bible has been protected throughout the centuries by the Lord so that you and I today might have his truth and as the Holy Spirit speaks I believe he's going to lead us through his scriptures and show us and unveil truths that only he understands and will help us to understand so that's what we endeavor to do here in Romans and we'll continue on and expect and hope that the Holy Spirit will have mercy on us to lead us into that truth. So let's go to verse 4. It says, let me shrink this, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So here it is again that we saw in verse 1, not walking after the flesh but after the spirit, the condition that of this righteousness. And we discover that Christ Jesus dethroned and sentenced to death sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So how is the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us, is the question we need to ask. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, as I was mentioning. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. This comes from Hebrews 10, 15, and 16. Where it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So under the new covenant the law is no longer something merely written on stone or with pen and ink. It is written on the hearts and minds of all who believe. It's not a dead letter but a spiritual one. Not something outward but inward. It is the royal law, the law of love for God and man. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Remember in our study, if you've been with us, in Romans 3.31, Paul makes this comment through the Holy Spirit. And we know that by grace through faith, we are enabled to entirely obey God. Our Lord has condemned sin in the flesh, and now we naturally do what is right, because we love righteousness and hate iniquity, as it's stated of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. 
that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows because he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity. And that is to be our nature, our new nature, as we are born again. If you are a born again believer, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, that's to become your nature. We're to, be, we're to uh, have a heart after our Lord. And our Lord hates iniquity, but he loves righteousness. And, you know, it's not one or the other, it's both. So many hold to the opinion that righteousness is something merely imputed unto those who believe in Christ. And perhaps you've heard this. They teach that Jesus obeyed the law for us and his righteousness is accounted unto us. Therefore, we are under no obligation to obey. Indeed, according to them, it is not possible for us to obey. They are fond of applying Romans 3.10 to the Christian. There is none righteous, no, not one. And perhaps you've seen that in practice, where Christians assume that the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed unto us and that you as a Christian there's no obligation uh, to walk in righteousness anymore because it, there's nothing you can do it's an imputed work uh, and you're still unrighteous and you're unable to walk in God's commandments even as a Christian being filled with the Holy Spirit and they'll, they'll quote unto you this, misquote it, that there is no none righteous, no, not one. But Paul was not applying this verse to those who had been justified by faith, but to those who were not so much as seeking after God and who, who were out of the way. Let's go on. We read in, in the next two verses in Romans 3.11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. All right, so these believers are not even seeking. They've gone out of the way. It's not applied to the on-fire, born-again Christian who is on fire to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 10.10, 10, Paul declares something. He says, with the heart, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so, Saint, um, so there's a belief involved unto righteousness. We have faith in our heart of what God has said and we are born again we are forgiven and you know we confess with our mouth um, this new salvation but now we're to walk in holiness we are to be set apart from sin St. John so let's I just want to show the verse again where we're at that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us okay who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit St. John says he utterly destroys this nonsense that God considers us righteous while we continue in sin. John writes, If we know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. In 1 John 2.29, which is shown to you. He also says in 1 John 3.7, he says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. There's a doing of righteousness. You're not considered righteous by a, a matter of imputation or having it imputed unto you. You have to do it. Yes, when we're born again, it's only through the atonement of Jesus. And we can't merit that uh, gift it's it's unmerited towards all who will put their faith and trust in Jesus and God uh, sovereignly pardons the sinner and now he expects that you walk in holiness that you walk uh, hating sin and removing yourself from sin not having your garments spotted by the spots of the flesh okay 
So there's numerous examples in which the Bible speaks of believers being righteous or practicing righteousness. Let's look at some of these. You know, we want, we want our faith to be grounded in the Scripture, in God's Word, not of our own opinion, not what we think, not what we've heard sermons on that perhaps uh, didn't take into account all of God's Word. We want to make sure we cover God's Word and are led by the Scriptures through the leading of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's look at some of these. Matthew 10.41 He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Okay, so there's an action here involved for a man to be righteous. Matthew 25, 37. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? So this is when the Lord in Matthew 25 separates the sheep from the goats. And guess what? The sheep, the righteous, were those who had done good works, those who had obeyed the Lord in some capacity. They recognized the Lord's presence in their brethren, the least of those, his brethren. Um, you know, it's one thing to just, yeah, if the Lord's standing in front of your face, to treat him like the king that he is. But when he's disguised, when he is living or indwelling believers, and you mistreat believers, well, you've done it unto the Lord. Or if you treat believers well, you've done also that unto the Lord. And that's a delineating factor between the sheep and the goats. All right, so we go. let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. So we're, we're talking here of Ze Zacharias and Elizabeth. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Ze Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now let's look at this testimony. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Woe! The Lord considered them meeting the commandments and ordinances uh, 100%. They're blameless in the Lord's eyes. They're considered righteous. And it wasn't just because it was imputed to them. It was because they were acting on the Lord's commands. And they were obeying them. And the Lord considered them righteous. Okay, let's go to John 5.28. And 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth that they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Notice here there's a doing good unto the resurrection of life. The ones who are doing good have done good. It's too late at that point with the resurrection. But they've done good. They've had a history of that was their habits. That was their practice. And the same for those who are evil, that they're going to be resurrected unto damnation and ultimately be cast into a lake of fire. Okay, let's, let's move along. So, sorry, Acts 11, 22. The tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. All right, so Barnabas was considered a good man. He was considered a righteous man. 1 Corinthians 6.14 And God hath both, ra both raised up the Lord, and who will also raise up us by his own power. So, um, yeah, I'm just uh, looking at 
Oh, you know what? I have the wrong verse. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. It was 2 Corinthians 6.14, where Paul says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So there's an action here of, of fellowshipping with the righteous, not fellowshipping with those who walk in darkness. You know, as you become a new believer, when you're born again, your old friends, you're going to lose many of those old friends because they're not going to want to be converted to Christianity. They're perhaps going to want to stay on the broad way that leads to destruction. And now they see you as some alien, some weirdo, some Bible thumper that is stepped into a crazy way of life. And it's called the narrow path, the straight gate that Jesus talked about that leads to life that few find. And uh, so there's a doing, there's an action of getting onto that straight and narrow path and leaving the broad way that leads to destruction. And uh, so that's considered righteousness and that you no longer have communion with the old works of darkness. All right, so let's keep moving. Let's uh, see the next verse. First Peter 4.18 And if the righteous scarcely be saved... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? All right, so here there's a uh, action that has to take place in the, in the righteous that they have to turn from their sin. And, uh, you know, if the ungodly are unwilling to turn from their sin, they're not going to fare well in the judgment. So God's judgment in the previous verse, it says, must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? That's what verse 17 says. So, you know, he's talking about a comparison of those who obey the gospel of God and those who don't. And, uh, and if the righteous are scarcely saved because walking on this narrow path, then those who are not walking on the narrow path, they have no chance. The sinners will be judged horrifically. Um, well, they'll be given what they deserve. They'll be judged fairly. However, it'll be severe because we deserve a severe judgment for our sin. That's why Jesus died. That's why he brought the atonement. Okay, uh, let's go to 3 John 11, or 111. 3 John, uh, yeah, chapter 1, verse 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Again, doing. You know, Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, he that heareth my words and doeth them is the one likened to a wise man. And he that heareth these words and doeth them not is likened unto a foolish man. There's an action involved when you believe on Jesus Christ, an action of obedience. Revelation 22.11 Here is, you know, at the final judgment, uh, he that is unjust, you know, here God has been pouring out his judgments upon humanity. He's unveiling his son in the book of Re Revelation, the Apocalypso, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, his holiness, that he's coming as judge. He says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Isn't it interesting here? There's two classes, those who are righteous and those who are holy. So, yes, you are righteous when you come into God's kingdom. And through a process of sanctification, as the Lord changes you, as you yield to the changes, then you are moving on a path to holiness. You are trans being transformed. Your heart is being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. As you allow, by your free will, the Holy Spirit to lead you, to work in you, to reveal his truth, and you respond to his truth. But he's saying here, there comes a point when the wicked, just let him go ahead and be filthy still. Let him be unjust still. Because uh, perhaps at that point, it's too late to repent. You know, there is a limit to God's repentance. And in the book of Revelation, when Jesus returns... 
that there is going to be a limit to his patience and a limit to his his uh, mercy and a limit to repentance for mankind that they are going to be sealed at some point and not be allowed into God's kingdom that it's going to be too late you know everyone who dies without the Lord Jesus they're sealed in in the state in which they left they are you know if they are wicked then they're consigned to hell and if they're righteous then they get to go and be with the Lord in heaven so yeah so there uh, there we see it many scriptures throughout the New Testament of why we need to live holy live uprightly and that righteousness is a thing that we do not something that is imputed unto us um, so Christ's righteousness is neither imputed or accounted imputed is an, a fancy word for accounted accounted like an accountant like in ledger books that an accountant would use it's not imparted to us unto the believer like Jesus waves a magic wand and automatically we're righteous um, Paul says in Romans 4 that Abraham's faith his faith all right it's Abraham's faith not Jesus Christ's faith but Abraham's faith was counted unto him for righteousness. And let's look at those verses. Romans 4, 3. Start there. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. All right, so this Abraham's faith was accounted unto him for righteousness because faith always embraces righteousness. And I, you know, I'm thinking of in John 8, uh, where the, you know, the Jews. Uh, prided themselves in front of Jesus that we're not born of fornication our father is Abraham and Jesus said well if Abraham was your father you would do the works of Abraham but you seek to kill me and this didn't the Abraham didn't do this Abraham rejoiced to see my day come and then they got into it that you knew Abraham you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham and he says at the end of it, well, before Abraham was, I am. You know, an awesome declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But he's saying that you Jews who want to kill me, which they said, you have a demon. Who wants to kill you? You want to kill me, and this did not Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see my day coming. And that Abraham's faith always embraces righteousness. If it does not, it's not a justifying faith. Neither is Christ's righteousness imparted, because righteousness and must be uh, is because righteousness is and must be a voluntary state of being. Righteousness is subjective; it has no existence independent of moral agents. It's not an object that God infuses into the believer. That's pretty deep. So Jesus Christ's righteousness is not imparted because righteousness is and must be a voluntary state of being. Right, so uh, it's how we respond to God's word. It's a, it's a response of acting on God's word of obedience. Just like sin is the transgression of God's law. That's an act of disobedience. It's a willful act. So is righteousness. It's a willful or voluntary act. Um, and it has no existence independent of moral agents. So it's not this thing that stands on its own that's magically imparted to us, but it is something that we have to work out through our obedience uh, and obey the Lord's commandments. And so there is obligation on our part. No, we're not forgiven by our works of righteousness. That is only done through the atonement of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about a works-based salvation in the beginning, but we're talking about a walking in holiness after you've been saved. 
And that is your righteousness. That is what you're living out. And God looks at your actions. God looks at your obedience. And he'll declare you righteous based on your adherence to his word, your adherence to the, the leading of the Holy Spirit into truth. All of that. So what then is the doctrine of Paul's concerning imputed righteousness? So if imputed righteousness is not what Paul is saying, Paul quoted the psalmist here. I have this still on the screen. Romans 4, 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. In verse Romans 4, 6. So Paul taught that righteousness will be imputed to us as it was to Abraham. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Okay, so that, let's go to that verse, Romans 3.24. So, being justified freely by his grace through the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, Paul instructed that our faith is a necessary condition for God to account us as righteous. We can be thankful that works on our part are not a condition for God to declare us justified. If so, our situation would have been hopeless. Indeed, when we first believed, we had no good works to offer him. All of our actions were corrupted by our selfishness. So God considered us to be righteous before we had any good works to offer on the condition of our faith in God's love to us. Okay, so let's read that again. So God considered us to be righteous before we had any good works to offer on the condition of our faith in God's love to us by giving his son as an atonement for our sins. So we had no basis to be considered righteous. God merely and simply forgave us when we came to him and were born again. But however, this is what I was talking about, however, to remain justified, we must keep the faith that produces works. Those who have saving faith have the faith which works by love. And this is Galatians 5, 6. This, this is the saving faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So the fictitious notion, the fictitious notion that Christ's righteousness is imputed to the believer is impossible because character is personal and not transferable. That's a good statement. Character is personal and not transferable. You can't transfer it. God can't just automatically download righteousness to you and I. It's a personal matter. It's a step-by-step -step walk walking loving relationship with the Lord one yes after another one act of obedience after another you are yielding your will to the Lord's desire for your life and it's not just something the Lord just automatically when you're born again he puts a, uh, a USB stick in you in your neck and downloads his software into your brain and you begin to walk uh, as the Lord wants you to that would make us a robot at that point. And we all know we have a free will. God doesn't want a robot. He wants you to work out righteousness by your own choice. Do you love God? Well, prove it. Prove that you do by desiring to keep his commandments. Prove that you do by working for the Lord and ministering to others in his name. Be open to the Lord's direction. It's not transferable. It's this personal relationship. And not only that, but Christ himself was obligated to obey the law. Had he failed, he would not have been able to make an acceptable atonement. So Jesus walked a sinless life. He walked a perfect life. And he, that's what he wants for us after we're born again. He, there's an obligation. Jesus always had an obligation to keep the law. Well, you say, well, you know, that was Jesus. We can't keep the law. But no, it says, the word says that he was tempted in all points like as you and I, but yet without sin. So Jesus became a man. He emptied himself. He took upon himself the form of a servant. And he was tempted in all points like as you and I. And yet he passed. 
He allowed the devil to come at him with serious temptations, and he passed them all. What did he do? He used the word of God. And he walked by the leading of the Holy Spirit, and his faith was grounded in love. So there would have been no acceptable atonement if Jesus had failed in the area of obedience to the law. So now let's look at uh, the, the topic of, of carnal Christians. All right, Is there such a thing as a carnal Christian? So we get on to verse 5. And it says that the uh, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. So for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. So one is either minding or obeying is what this word here means the flesh, or minding or obeying again the spirit. So you're either obeying the flesh or obeying the spirit. It's one or the other. And you cannot do both simultaneously. You can't walk after the Holy Spirit or after the flesh at the same time. So those who consider Paul's experience in Romans 7 Christian and who believe that a Christian has a dual nature have made a very nice arrangement for the flesh not only to survive but to flourish all right so there are many out there we've talked on this that they believe Romans 7 is the experience of the Christian which we taught that no it's not it was uh, not the experience of a Christian that Paul was reflecting on his life um, he was a uh, convinced and convicted sinner but he wasn't yet converted so there was a point where he loved God's law but he couldn't keep it and he was convicted by God's law and he recognized that he was in sin and he had no power to obey what he wanted to do that was a man who was being convicted but he was not yet converted he had not yet found Jesus Christ all right so uh, what what people who believe that this is the that Romans 7 describes the natural state or the normal state of a Christian are basically allowing themselves to have a dual nature. It's a nice arrangement for their flesh to survive being a Christian. You're, you're enabled to indulge your flesh and not only survive but to flourish. Paul emphasizes we are to give no place to the flesh whatsoever. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, no, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Yeah, Paul said this. Romans 13:14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So Paul couldn't have met, meant that Romans 7 was for the normal Christian life. When he's saying make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, he knew you can't, you can't, you can't keep your flesh and obey the Spirit at the same time. That we are entering a life as a Christian to be led by the Spirit of God and not by our old fleshly lusts, which will lead to death. So don't make provision for the flesh. In our life before Christ, we all minded the flesh by indulging in unlawful desires, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, as a result of our wrong choice to live selfishly, the children of wrath, even as others. All right? I just quoted you Ephesians 2, 3. So among whom also we had our conversation, or our behavior in times past, before we were Christians, in the lusts of our flesh, we followed the passions of the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, what our corrupt mind wanted to do. We were filled with sinful, ungodly knowledge and were by nature the children of wrath. We deserved God's judgment. We lived in disobedience to God 100% all the time, nearly all the time, in our thoughts, in our motives, in our intents, in our actions. Um, and we were by nature the children of wrath. So Paul exhorts these, those at Ephesus who had professed Christ, but were deceived by false teachers, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of life, 
the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Right? So he's telling the, these Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation or life the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in, the right, in righteousness and true holiness. So the sensible person always takes off the old and filthy garments but before putting on the new. The senseless are content to wear the new over the old and dirty, or gradually to put on the new and take off the old. Yeah, so if you're wearing, if you have dirty clothes, before you put on your new clothes that are clean, you're going to want to clean up. You're going to want to take the dirty clothes off. But if you don't have a lick of sense, then you don't care if you put the new clothes on over the dirty. Or if you, or you, it's, it's okay for you to slowly change these clothes. That doesn't make any sense. But this is what Paul is saying at the new birth, that we're to put off the old man, we're to put off the old lust, fleshly desires of our mind and of our, our former life, and we're to put on the new, right? We're to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, so let's continue on. In Romans 8, 6 now. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to be carnally minded is death. Now remember, in Romans 7.14, here's what Paul said. Let's have a look at it again. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. This is Paul's life as a convicted sinner. He knew the law was good, but yet he didn't keep it. Uh, there was a contradiction. There was a conflict. There was a turmoil in Paul's life. He was under the conviction of God's spirit. Who's going to deliver him from the body of this death? So Paul is remembering and he says, I am carnal, sold under sin. And this is further proof, this sold under sin, he's a slave of sin. Further proof that Paul in chapter 7 is reflecting on his experience prior to conversion. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. Anyone carnally minded is spiritually dead. This idea of a carnal Christian is a contradiction in terms. And perhaps you've heard it, that some Christians, they just live carnally. Uh, but they're still Christian, right? So mankind has three cardinal faculties, according to Jed. Intelligence, which is a mind with the ability to reason, his moral nature. Then there's sensibility, the ability to feel and experience his emotional nature. And the will, his volition. Now, the individual who is carnally minded has his will submitted to gratifying his sensibilities. He is governed by his emotions, passions, and natural appetites. His abiding purpose in life is self-indulgence. The spiritually minded man submits his will to his intelligence and the law of reason. And the law of reason is developed and applied by the Spirit of God. His mind, his intellect is submitted to the Holy Spirit. The spiritual man minds the things of the Spirit. The settled preference in his life is the will of God. So that's a rational response. He's not led by his sensibilities. He's led by his intelligence, his mind, his ability to reason. And this is where the Holy Spirit is working. He's working in that, that area to influence our free will, to choose what is right. Our intelligence, the law of reason, is being applied and developed by the Spirit of God. His mind, his intellect, is submitted to the Holy Spirit. This is the spiritual man. The spiritual man minds the things of the Spirit. The settled preference in his life is the will of God. That's a settled... Uh, he sets his mind to prefer that his life is going to be governed by the will of God. Christians are often cautioned when seeking the will of God. 
they're often cautioned and it might go like this don't let your intellect get in the way this advice can be dangerous and is often disastrous usually resulting in one's emotions and selfish desires holding sway in one's decisions so if you've heard this be aware our rational faculties separate us from the animal kingdom we are capable of making moral decisions while animals are merely creatures of instinct would God give us the wonderful faculty of the mind of human intellect and reason and then as Christians not expect us to use it granted the intellect of the unbeliever is often a hindrance to faith because he may be reasoning falsely for instance the humanist reasons from the false premise that man is at the center of the universe although his reasoning might be consistent in the nature in the light of that presupposition his wrong premise brings him to false conclusions but the Christian reasons with the assumption that God is at the center of the universe and that God is at the center of his life unfortunately with many Christians God is not at the center and since self still reigns their reasoning often does lead them to miss the will of God so faith and reason are to be friends not enemies many today see a contradiction between faith and reason but there is but that is not true at all as a matter of fact true faith is rooted and grounded in evidence and reason yet many people today have faith confused with credulity or uh, being gullible they will believe anything so Jed is commenting here that a student one asked once asked him how do you take the leap of faith and he answered faith is not a leap but a decision to submit the will to truth and has been perceived by that has been perceived by the mind God is not asking you to believe the unbelievable but the believable your problem may be that you have not heard enough of the truth to believe you need to make a serious study of the claims of and evidence for Christianity hallelujah so God wants to work through your mind he wants to work through your intellect he wants to work through your reason he doesn't want to work through your emotions um, he wants to appeal to your reason that you make an informed choice but to do that a man or a woman has to be open has to be uh, willing has to make a decision to say I will investigate this for myself I will search out the claims of Christianity I will instead of making a blind leap of faith I you know I've seen Muslims who uh, you know one Muslim in particular I'm thinking of who was eventually converted to Christianity he was always taught that the scriptures had been twisted and so you know throughout the centuries and so he began to research um, the uh, propagation uh, of the New Testament from the first church um, through over the centuries and how it was translated and how it was distributed and there was no centralized control it was sent out and people took it and translated it into their own language and then when you when you collect all these manuscripts there's over 25,000 I believe manuscripts of the New Testament alone where you can reconstruct the entire New Testament and they're from different languages but yet it will align with the oldest uh, or some of the the Textus Receptus you can reconstruct the whole Bible so there was no centralized control of the scriptures which would have made it easier if anyone wanted to twist or bend the scriptures so that they could twist it in the way they wanted but because it was so well distributed it protected the the authority the accuracy of the scriptures no man could twist it without it being easily seen in other areas and then it would have been rejected so he came to the conclusion that no the scriptures hadn't been twisted just by the very nature of how Christianity started and how the passing along of the scrolls um, and translations went about in Christendom and that was just one of the uh, things that God used to convince his intellect that Jesus Christ was true 
You know, and then you can go after the resurrection, the, histor the historicity of the resurrection, the truth behind the resurrection, how Christianity was started, the uh, corroborating documents that bolster and uh, support the New Testament and the Gospels. So there are, there are secular writings that talk of the crucifixion of Jesus and the beginning of Christianity that confirm the sayings that are in the Bible. You know, look at Josephus, the historian, and other uh, historians that corroborate. And, and uh, you know, those who aren't even believers, but they just declare the facts of history. So you can, you can look and search all these things out to bolster your faith and to, to make an informed choice. And the Lord wants to show you those things and uh, appeal to your reason because the whole Bible is true. Christianity is true, 100%. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't just make a leap of faith. So faith is not a leap, but a decision to submit your will to truth that has been perceived by the mind. God is not asking us to believe the unbelievable, but the believable. So many times our problem is that we've just not heard enough of the truth to believe. And maybe people are unwilling because of sin. They harden their hearts because they want to live their life how they want to live it, in pleasure, in fulfilling the lusts of their flesh. But you need to make a serious study of the claims and the evidences for Christianity, my friend. And God wants you to do that. All right. Um, you know, I was going to try and tackle uh, verse 7. I don't think I'm going to do that in this video. We've been going a little bit long. I think we're going to end it there. So, uh, you know, three verses. Um, what a blessing. We're going to we're going to see how God wants us to be uh, to have the old man crucified in our life, to not be led of the flesh, that we're to put that old man down and we're to walk in a newness of life to be led of his spirit. Uh, for the as many are the children of God, they are the are for as many as that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We're going to see that in Romans eight. This is the life of the Christian. This is the life Jesus wants for us. Um, so hang in, hang in this study with me, friends. This is a long study, but Romans is worth it. It's not only taking us through Romans, but you know m much of the Scripture. And uh, you know I'm appealing to your reason. I'm appealing to your your mind in these studies that you make informed choices to believe on Jesus Christ have you made him your Lord today friend not just your Savior Jesus wants to be your Lord he's calling out to you that you submit to him give your life to him he's worthy of your worship he's worthy of your life he paid for your sins by his atoning sacrifice he laid down his body on the cross shed his blood for you and I that we might have everlasting life if we'll but believe on him and put our trust in him and follow him with our whole hearts have you done that today friend my prayer is that you will consider it after hearing just some of the words in this study uh, get down on your knees ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart but not only as your Savior ask him to forgive you to cleanse you of your sin ask him to pardon you of your iniquity and if he sees that you're serious, if he sees that you mean it, and that you are asking, you are committing, you are covenanting, covenanting him, with him to obey him, to follow him, if he sees that you mean it, he'll pardon you, he'll surely forgive you, and you can have a new life. You can enter into this new life, being born again, being filled with his spirit, and walking in this newness of life and being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, being changed. My friend, you can only do that by trusting in Jesus as your Lord. Call upon him today while he is near. So consider that, uh, you know, if you've ever made that prayer, feel free to, to comment on this video. Feel free to speak your mind. I'd love to hear it. Praise the Lord that this video is getting out, that, this, uh, that you're responding to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. So join me again, friends, when we continue on in Romans 8 in the next video. God bless you till then.